Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I'll take a look at a book titled Rereading the Manual of Travelling Exhibitions, UNESCO 1953 by Andreas Müller and Aaron Verbeek, published by Spectre Books. The Manual of Travelling Exhibitions, published by UNESCO in 1953, is a handbook that effectively standardized the organization of touring exhibitions. Aimed at museums and other public institutions, it formulates a grammar of how to exhibit. From today's perspective, the manual reads like the manifesto of a modernity whose continuity was still uncontested in the immediate post-war period. While the Manual of Travelling Exhibitions was initially published as a guidebook for museum practitioners, it can be read as a document of its time, containing more than just pragmatic instructions. A critical re-reading of the manual provides an understanding of the role of the museum, the purpose of exhibitions or the potential of art as an educational tool in the immediate post-war years. In the same way that the popular DIY manuals of the 1970s show us the broader implications of self-building and participatory architecture new to their time, the Manual of Travelling Exhibitions tells us a lot about the developments that took place in the 1950s and the attempts for worldwide emancipation through education in which exhibitions and their design played a pivotal role. By rereading the Manual of Travelling Exhibitions, we retrace the historical situation in which it was possible to charge the medium of exhibition with enormous importance, up to the point where world peace was thought to be achievable through exhibiting. The world into which the Manual of Travelling Exhibitions was published in 1953 was still recovering from the catastrophe of the Second World War. A new world organization, the United Nations, was set up as a replacement for the ineffective League of Nations in order to prevent another such conflict. In 1945, representatives of 51 member states signed the UN Charter at a conference in San Francisco. The extensive conference that lasted for two months took place at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, whose director at the time was Grace Macken Morley, the author of the manual's foreword. This close relationship between the establishment of a new world organization and the cultural space of a museum might be symptomatic of the universalist approach to culture of the time and the shared optimism regarding the goals of humankind. UNESCO was founded in 1946 with the purpose to foster and in many ways construct the notion of global peaceful coexistence through the promotion of education, science and culture. The preamble of its constitution states, Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. It was thought that this construction work should be the joint agenda of educational, scientific and cultural programs and institutions around the globe. In the first few years of UNESCO, an inventory of cultural and educational institutions that had been destroyed in the war was thrown up. Subsequently, international aid measures to restore the damaged school systems were set up, as well as programs for the restoration of research and teaching centers, libraries, archives and museums. Exhibitions as a form played a crucial role in the concept of UNESCO, as they were considered a mass medium, a globally understandable communication tool and a comprehensive educative instrument that was comparable to the two other mass media of the era, newspapers and radio. Two new technological concepts that were explored by designers at the time supported the idea of the traveling exhibition as a mass medium information theory and visual communication. Information theory had developed the idea that information was the substance through which communication works, that it could be analyzed into elementary particles and therefore synthesized, processed and sent to a receiver. This idea of information can be found in the publication, where there is no differentiation made between art exhibitions and exhibitions of archaeological or ethnographic objects, findings of natural science, government information, consumer products and even trade fairs. 
every one of these exhibitions transmitted information, serving to educate the visitors. With sources in the classic avant-garde practices, visual communication explored the conveyance of ideas and information through visual means. Pioneered by Otto Neurath in the 1930s and imported to the U.S. by Bauhaus emigres such as Herbert Bayer, Laszlo Molinage and Georgi Kepesh, the term visual communication evoked an idea of communication that is not limited by conventional language barriers. Visual communication, therefore, had the potential to become a universal language accessible to every human being a concept that seemed ideal for the universalist approach of UNESCO. In 1950, UNESCO created its own division of museums and monuments in order to deal on an intergovernmental level with questions in museography and the protection, preservation and restoration of monuments and archaeological and historic sites. Importantly, the division of museums and monuments developed and carried out the exchange of information concerning museum work the exchange of museum professionals through grants, as well as the exchange of traveling exhibitions between member states. It also maintained a museographical documentation center in the Paris headquarters, where museums were asked to place their publications, catalogues, guides and photographic documentation of their exhibitions. Today's UNESCO World Heritage Program is the most prominent offshoot of the early division of museums and monuments. The division's work was published in a quarterly periodical called Museum, edited by Raymond Freen, who is also listed as an advisor to the Manual of Traveling Exhibitions. The titles of its first issues represented UNESCO's understanding of museum work as a form of education. Museums and Education, Children and the Museum, Museums in the Service of All. The issue number three of 1950, titled Museums and Circulating Exhibitions, can be seen as a blueprint for the Manual of Traveling Exhibitions. Many of its authors appear in the acknowledgments page in the manual. Almost all of the non-American case studies in the manual, including the images, are taken from this issue of museum. However, there is a noticeable difference between the 1950 publication of Museum and the manual which was published three years later. The issue of Museum was edited in Paris and shows mainly European case studies, whereas the manual was made in New York, edited by the director of the Museum of Modern Arts Department of Circulating Exhibitions, with the majority of its case studies taken from American museums. This might be due to the availability of high-quality image material at the MoMA and an advanced experience with the subject of traveling exhibitions, but it might also indicate a shift away from the universalist ethos of UNESCO and towards an emerging US-American ambition for cultural hegemony. 1953 was a decisive year in post-war history. The euphoria of a global, peaceful, universal culture which shaped the first years of UNESCO was dampened by geopolitical conflicts that ultimately turned into the Cold War. The arms race and economic competition between the two blocs was complemented by a range of cultural competitions to extend their successive spheres of influence. American cultural policy used UNESCO as a platform to promote specifically Western concepts of culture. Government agencies such as the United States Information Agency were established in order to formulate and spread propagandistic information about the benefits of the American system. The traveling exhibition was again one of their favorite formats. This book consists of two parts. The first part comprises the original manual of traveling exhibitions as a reprint, accompanied by a series of comments from the perspectives of graphic design and bookmaking by Kurt Eckert, and on curating and exhibition making by Moritz Kuhn. And an additional layer of comments was added by Andreas Müller, building on the research of the editorial team. The comments make visible the act of rereading, an intellectual appropriation, transformation and co-production of the historic book. The intentions of the comments can be very different. 
they can interpret a given idea by following it up or specifying it in more detail. They can actualize it by comparing it with the present situation. They can contextualize it by describing the historic situation. They can create associations with similar or contrary thoughts. They can criticize it from varying positions. This method of rereading allows us to approach the historic publication and to explore its potential for today's many discourses about exhibition design. The second part of the publication consists of contributions by various authors based on specific pages in the original book. Different forms of text are combined with artistic works, photographs and archival materials to contextualize specific aspects of the manual. There is a strange contradiction between the grandiose, ideologically backed claims that the editors of the manual assign to the media of exhibitions and the pragmatic, hands-on information of a manual. In our re-reading of the manual, we assume that these two strains should be read together as two sides of the same phenomenon. Both the pragmatic information and the political intentions formulated between the lines are characteristic for the modernist idea of exhibiting as a form of educating, which informed the manual in the first place and runs through every page of it, its content and structure, its selection of images, its graphic design, and its production as a material object. The reconstruction of a situation where exhibitions belong to the realm of education is interesting for exhibition making practices in our current age, where it is often that exhibitions are considered simply as plain entertainment or as individual artistic expressions. Within the complex terrain of radical changes in mass communication that have taken place since the advent of the Internet, the idea of an exhibition as a mass medium might be an interesting anachronism. Yet, we find the seriousness in which the manual claims exhibitions as communication devices awkwardly compelling. The book has a soft cover and was designed by Johannes Hucht and Lena Tomaka and printed in Germany on uh, amber graphic paper. As for it at your local bookstore, thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one.